This is the Stock Trade and Reality Podcast, episode 211. There's no emotions. <laughs> it's just really leveraging data to make that decision for me. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host. The discovery of Advocado Toast is quickly turning him into a hippie. Clay Trader. I'm pretty sure I don't know what's going on, but I seem to be turning into more and more of a hippie every single day. I think I've talked about this before, but at a, a, a previous fun fact, my brother-in-law who's out in uh, California actually works for Google, but he's in California, okay? San Francisco area, there's like hippies all over the place. And he came back and I'm like, oh, you gotta try this coffee maker and you do this, that, and the other. So now I'm a coffee snob all of a sudden. And now I'm eating avocado toast goodness. To all you hippies in California, it's fine. Peace and love, rock and roll. Don't get upset about things. I'm just, I'm just having a good time. You can make fun of me too. I'm in the Midwest, fly over country, whatever you wanna, I can take it. Make fun of me too, it's just all in good fun. But yeah, avocado toast. If you First off, avocados in general are just magnificent. Not only from a taste perspective, I think, but run a little Google search on the health benefits of avocados. Boo, yeah. Healthy fats, nutrients, and mi oh man, they're, they are truly good for you. And well, they're high in calories. Don't stop listening to that stuff, okay? They're a real food. They're a whole food. Just eat them. Don't worry about the calorie. Just eat them. They're healthy for you. They're good for you. And if you think you're gonna get fat eating avocados, I will just say, show me one study that says, avocados lead to obesity. I've never seen such a study. Fried food, yeah. Sugar, yep. Avocados, no, never seen a study, but now I'm derailing the conversation. But yeah, avocado toast, that's some solid stuff. And we had some people in the chat room bring it up and you know uh, talk about it and you know, and then of course, I mean, I hear my sister and my brother-in-law. Oh, that's like a staple out there. Uh, I, I think it's in in California, San Francisco. It's it's bread, water, and avocado toast. I'm pretty sure. Um, but I've tried it. I've loved it. And yeah, I'm becoming a hippie. In today's interview, uh, again, Chez. Now Chez is okay. I realize that Chez has been gone a while, but we just had a, a clump of interviews that all showed up. So, and he was sick over this clump, but it's not like he's been sick for the past three weeks or however long, however these things play out here. So it's okay, Chez, well, I, I, I hope Chez you're still alive by the time this airs and goes live, but I'm pretty sure Chez is fine. Um, so I realize there's the illusion that he's been gone forever and it's because he's been sick, but in all actuality, it was just uh, you know this small um, you know jump in time when we were, or slice, in time, slice of time, just like a slice of avocado toast when all this is occurring, but he is okay. And uh, so it's just gonna be uh, myself again and I am talking with Sean. And if you're a geek, if you're a nerd, you're gonna like this one. He talks about a spreadsheet and this spreadsheet really caught my eye and I was, I mean, now there's more than a spreadsheet, but the, what I most admire about Sean is he just understands that there's more to trading than signing up for a text alert and then thinking that somebody's gonna email you a, or send you a text alert while you're on the golf course and you're gonna make, he understands that this stuff takes effort. He understands that this stuff takes a thought process. He understands that this stuff takes a lack of emotion. You wanna remove emotion from the picture. And we talk about all that stuff, how he is going about removing emotion, what he's trying to do, you know, his analyzation process, all of that we talk about. And this is what it looks like to set yourself up, to build good habits. Because when you have good habits, you can scale them. So if you're somebody that's more so at the beginning of things and wondering how do you actually approach the market, how do you try to ensure that emotions are not at the driver, Am I saying you have to do exactly, exactly what Sean is doing? No, absolutely not. There's no holy grail system. But the general premise here is that there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of quote unquote stuff that Sean is doing and, and that's what it takes. As much as I wish I could say that, yeah, you just sign up for a text alert service and that's it. 
That's not the reality of the matter. This is the reality of the matter, especially in terms of the sorts of processes that you should be going through to ensure that you're structuring proper plans that fit your personal time schedule and fit your personal risk tolerance level. So without further ado, let's hear from Sean. Sean, welcome to the show. Hey, Clay. Glad to be here. We just discovered right before we got recording that we're, we're neighbors separated by a big puddle, the puddle known as Lake Michigan. Indeed. And you said you were over in Milwaukee. Now, I'm trying to think, my, I know it's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I, I do know that amount, but yep. is Milwaukee, how far is Milwaukee from actually the coast? Like Michigan, like Lake Michigan yeah, like, coast? Yeah, Lake Michigan coast, yes. It's it's actually right there, butting up against the lake. I Is it? Okay. Yep. I live about a half hour west in a smaller town called Pewaukee, so I'm just outside. It's a little suburb. So there's Milwaukee and Pewaukee? Indeed, there's a lot of little towns surrounding Milwaukee, but the population, Milwaukee and surrounding area is about a million people, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. I mean, maybe you know this. I'm I'm guessing maybe there was some sort of like walkie Indian tribe at some point. Is that where all these walkies are coming from? Do you I, Yep, I believe something like that. Yep. That's in the ballpark. That would make sense. I, but I, I always just thought it was Milwaukee. I did not know there were any other walkies out there. So there you go, listeners. There's your fun fact for the uh for the episode. <laughs> now, Sean, um, let's just, for listeners' sake, if you're new to the show, we try to keep this keep this as real as possible as if Sean and I are sitting down for some coffee and you're just a fly on the wall. So we, we talked very briefly, but um, I'm, let me establish some context. I know you're a member, but are you in the chat room? Do you participate in the chat room? I do not. I have a full-time job and I have popped into the chat room uh, from time to time, but I just, I can't commit at this time. Do you ever talk at all? Or are you just kind of uh, just creeping in the shadows? When I first joined your, um, your courses, I kind of popped in that first day and I love the content. I just can't commit to the, the dialogue and kind of engage at this moment. Okay, that makes sense. So there we go. You are a member, just not in the chat room because a lot of I was because when I forget, people are like, "Well, is this person in the chat room?" Well, I don't know. So I've learned to start mm-hmm. to ask. But now, have we have we talked on email ever before? My apologies if we have, but I, I talk on a lot of emails. But have we spoken before this at all? We have, yeah, via email and via chat. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm not even gonna pretend like I can remember anything. So, <laughs> That's fine. I, I, okay, thank you. Thank you for not taking offense. Uh, I, I do promise that the name looked vaguely familiar, but if you were to say, what did we talk about? I, I, I'm not quite sure, but sure. Uh, you said you listened to past episodes, so you know what questions come your way. But yeah, I mean, sure. where did all this start for you? Where did the journey, be, journey begin? Where'd you first hear about the market? And then what kind of all played out and unfolded to get you to the point were you like, you know, that, that's pretty interesting. I want to try to get a little bit more hands-on with it. Sure. So it was around 2015 and 16. I And, and prior to that, I have been doing some angel investing. My background is uh, software engineering management. So I, I'm very involved in the tech industry. But around 2015, 16, I decided I wanted to get more involved with stock investing. So I started... Uh, you know, I hear this term on your podcast, the, uh, the the rabbit hole of YouTube videos. So I was totally there, like researching investing. And I wanted to learn like true value investing, like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger type stuff first. But I actually discovered you around 2016. And I did like your content, but it was more focused on options trading. And I wanted to spend the time first on getting good at value investing. And I know you're, you do a little bit of investing training, but it's, it, it looks like it's a lot more options trading. So, so after I really got the hang of investing, it took about two, three years to really get honed in. And um, that's when I said, you know what, let's start diving into options trading. And to be honest with you, I was listening to a few other podcasts um, of guys that teach options courses. And I went into one that guy's charismatic, good guy, um, really liked his content. But I tell you what, his his courses were just very broken. There were a lot of uh, missing steps and, and it, it brought me up to speed a little bit. So I wasn't completely satisfied. So I moved on to another course um, through referral and that was okay too. <laughs> 
And then how I, I finally move forward with you is, and you're going to laugh at this, um, I'm driving along listening to your podcast and you made the comment, you know what, for fun, I like to chop wood. And um, I started laughing because I grew up in the suburbs outside of Milwaukee and I, I'm an outdoorsman, so I, I do a lot of camping and fishing and whatnot. So I, I'm like, oh, that's the moment when I'm like, yeah, I need to move forward with your courses. So. Um, that was really the beginning of how I got that involved is, with Clay Trader that, University. That is good. I mean, so you're, you're clearly a, well, you're an outdoorsman, so you're right. a Clint, you, you like chopping wood then too, right? In, indeed. The simple thing. It is, life, it's right? relaxing, right? Would you recommend it to listeners that maybe think we're a couple of nutcases? I mean, there's something <laughs> therapeutic about it. I tell you what, you get out there, you think you're out there for 10 minutes, you look at the clock and you're like, wow, two hours just went by. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, I, that's a good way to describe it because I don't really know how to describe it, but that's exactly <laughs> it is. You just kind of like fall into some sort of trance or whatever. Yes. And you go to like some ulterior time dimension, you know, black hole. And um, plus it's, it's just, I mean, it's a good workout too. I it mean, is. Yes. It, before I forget, I, I'm curious and you, by no means are you wrong, but why, why value investing first? Why investing? Again, by no means wrong. Just curious. I mean, what 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 made you think, or why did you want to first focus on that area of the market? Sure. So I have always respected Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and there's other billionaire investors, and and they strongly uh, support value investing, like long term investing. You don't use it as like immediate revenue source or income stream, but these guys building their wealth over ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, I. I'm like, I have to learn that, that fundamental, because that's going to pay off in dividends 10, 20 years down the road. And it's already paying off now. So I'm glad I, I went forward with that training. So it was definitely more of a, I want to kind of almost walk out to my mailbox, open it up. Oh, there's some sort of check just sitting there, whether that's from dividends or whatever. But the point right. being, you're totally focused on the, the passive income, which I, I'm, in, I'm definitely in the same boat. Uh, yep. It sounds like both of our goals someday is to like lay in bed and be like, do I feel like doing anything today? <laughs> nope, I don't feel like doing anything. And knowing that there's still going to be, you know, money being gener generated somewhere within, you know, the grand plan of things. And that's, uh, yep. uh, I mean, for listeners out there, that that's kind of the name of the game. You, you don't want to always be working for your money. You want your, eventually your money to be working for you, which is exactly. totally possible. Um, and so I, I'm totally going along your premise of, of why you would want to focus on value investing sure. first um, and all of that. So you uh, start to listen to some options. Well, let me ask you this. So you're in value investing. You're, you're focusing on investing. Mm -hmm. How did you even hear about options? How did you learn about options just in general? Did you stumble across the YouTube video, like you said, when you were going down that rabbit hole? Or was this from a buddy that was like, hey, you got to check out these things called options. But where did that all come about? Sure. Yeah. Two places. So once you start value investing, you kind of learn of the other uh, methodologies and strategies uh, in the options world. So I was aware of it, but I never pursued it. And then through podcasts talking about like this other gentleman that I, I first moved forward with, I won't mention names on the podcast, but he would focus primarily on covered call writing. And I'm like, you know what, for immediate income, because you'd always talk about let's move forward with an immediate income generating strategy. And I like that. Um, something more passive, I don't have to spend all day doing. Um, so that's where I got into covered call writing. And then eventually when I landed on your material about just trading options, like swing trading um, as a, a great way to generate pretty much residual revenue. Um, I, I love it. This is, this is my jam. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a common theme, which you, you've already mm -hmm. touched on, but uh, very clearly you are not able to be chained to your computer like a day trader watching price movement right. every every 10 seconds. Correct. And the whole option swing trading stuff, I mean, that, that really would fit into you know what you've described as kind of your, your timetable in a, in a mm -hmm. daily sense. And uh, so do you, are you... Have you done covered calls and all that? I'm assuming you, uh, if you took that person's course, is that pretty much what he focused on was the cover calls or was there other types of option strategies that he was also focusing on? 
two strategies. He taught uh, covered calls and volatility training, and I never move forward. Uh, this will give you a little idea of the the education timeline I'm on. So I started the options path in September, actually, and I told myself, let's just go the first three months just doing education. And when I do education, it's it's very like deep dive with notes and I'm very thorough. And so there's no trading during that time. So then the new year, 2019 came around. And that's when I said, now let's start paper trading because that concept was thrown on quite a bit. So I went through the month of January, just paper trading with the goal to start live trading within three months. So I'm feeling pretty good after the first month of paper trading. Now we're into February. So we'll see how this month goes, but I'm, I'm getting really close to that point to start live trading. You mentioned you wanted to do a deep dive into education. Why? Right. And I realize this sounds kind of like a stupid question, but <laughs> just, I mean, for you, I get the impression it's kind of common sense, but common isn't so common out there as sure. I've discovered in the customer service chat box. So, I mean, why did you want to do a deep dive into education? So like what I do for work and software and in and, and my line of work is you never want to uh, rush projects or um, you, a lot of mistakes can happen in that case. So you definitely want to do your research. You want to be highly analytical if you want to be successful. Um, so it's just kind of a, a discipline I've really um, polished through the years is you want to do something right. So you got to focus on that discipline and um, you got to run through the, the trials and, and do some practice with that and then move forward. Because if you move forward with an uncalculated risk, you're, you're really just gambling. And what I always find fascinating is you bring up risk and people are like, well, there's a risk if I, and, I'm, and for listeners, this is not some sort of ulterior buy my courses. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, go buy somebody else's courses if, if you feel more comfortable with them. But what I come across all the time on the topic of risk is, well, there's a risk because if I if I if I buy your course, then there's a risk that it's a total waste of money and that I'm out of all that money or out of all that cash. Mm -hmm. But it's always like, well, why don't you look at the the other side of things? Like what Sean's talking about here is, well, I, I would argue that there's a much bigger risk by just going blind. Mm -hmm. Well, Clay, but I, I'm not blind because there's the internet. It's all free on the internet. Yeah including the bad information on the internet. That stuff's right. free too. So, I mean, that, that's a risk that I feel like a lot of people never account for, uh, which you do account for and, and you did, which is, are, are you an engineer or you just work with software engineers? Yeah, so my, give you my specific background is, came out of school, not trained or educated as an engineer, um, but learned that the software and IT world is where you want to be. So I learned how to code uh, I self-taught, but I, I learned I wasn't the best at coding. So I quickly switched to sales and project management. And I've been doing that for over 10 years. So uh, not an actual software engineer, but definitely um, selling projects and managing projects thereafter. That makes sense. Because the way you speak and the way you're, I can tell your thought process is, you sound like an engineer. It's like, first do this then go to paragraph D and then hop down <laughs> right. here, follow the flow chart back up there. Yeah. And so it's a very methodical way of thinking. I, I don't sense much randomness uh, in it. And just, I'm not asking you to throw the person under the bus or the, but you mentioned the course was just kind of, I can't remember the word you used, but it was. Uh, it had gaps in it. Yeah. So, okay. So right. it was just, I mean, there's information there, but it just wasn't, uh, you know, from A to Z, it was just missing several let letters along the way. Yeah, totally. I can I can speak to that a little bit, and this is probably good for the listeners to understand because I'll kind of dovetail into your courses when I was jumping around your site. But a lot of the informational products out there, let's say there's there's a hundred steps that you have to do something correct. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical number, and a lot of these people will they'll like do steps one, three, seven, ten, And when you start like actually practicing what they're preaching, you noticed like, like if you go over to trading and start doing things and clicking around, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like 
I'm missing steps here. Like there's something. So you you go back and look at the video again or the content and you you listen to it. Like, am I missing something? And and you just realize, and this is what I learned with the second option I went through, like the second course I went through is is the same thing. And there's a lot of people doing the same thing, like missing steps, missing practical moments. But when I landed on your site, I looked at the you've got the simplified uh, options and then advanced. And you actually listed every single video that's included. So I, I literally read each of those videos and I'm like, like right there, I could see where the gaps were missing. I'm like, you're going through it in just a list. So that's why and there is no hesitation. I'm like, I have to buy the courses to see the whole video. That, that to me, that filled the gap. So I, I appreciate what you did is how you laid out the content. You let people know what they're purchasing. And then the videos, I mean... Well done. They're they're very um, to the point, but you go into the technical detail you really need. It's all around good training. Almost like a former process engineer put them together. Who's <laughs> who had it beat had it beaten to his head? Listen, buddy, this is how you put together work instructions. Now do it this way. Yep. I mean, so a lot of people throw like, yeah, well, we get it, Clay. Okay, thanks for not leaving. But it's like I can't help it. That's what I was. Mm-hmm. That's what I was paid to do in my former life. That's what was drilled into my head as a process engineer. Yep. You have to figure out solutions, but then you have to be able to explain the solutions to other people. That's, you have to explain the process. So good. Well, I appreciate that. I, sure. Now out of curiosity, are you, did you just get the options courses or did you do any of the other courses? Just those two courses. That's where I okay. wanted to start first. Yep. Okay. So that, so that brings up the next question here. And by the way, full, I'm not trying to force you into any other courses. I'm sure. just, I'm just asking what are, uh, so what decisions are you using uh, for for what you're paper trading right now, the options. Meaning, for me, I, I would my driving force w- is you know the technical charts. I'm a big fan of charts, and I'm sure. not saying that's what you need to do. So, are you ever are you planning on using charts ever, or are you somehow going to be combining options with the fundamental investing stuff that you've already learned about? But I guess what is kind of the driving force behind your decisions right now that you are currently practicing with these options? Sure, it it is a little different than. Um, what I hear some of the other guests on your show talk about like charts is definitely a big conversation. I'm not looking at charts a whole lot. I have a, I have a shorter window before I start a nine to five work day. I, I like to look at, um, stocks that are rising pre-market. And then what I do is and in the stock market goes live at 8 30 AM I'm central time. So what I do is I immediately start plugging in data and I, I've been using Excel. I'm a, like a total Excel nerd. Um, so I, I plug in a bunch of variables into Excel and with about, within about 30 seconds to a minute, I can quickly qualify if that option is uh, wise to move forward with or not. And, and that gives me a good strategy. So by nine o'clock, I can, I can be done for the day for the swing. And um, I just, I set my alerts and then I'll get alerts through the day. And that's when I can pop back in and um, just sell them at that point. But, but it's just, it's really using Excel to analyze. And I do look at charts a little bit. Like I like to look at um, one month trend and a three month trend, but that's about it. But I will tell you this, I know I'm not going to like disregard charts. I do want to go forward with your course after I start doing some live trading this way. Now, I listen, if it's something where you're going to have to take me behind the shed and kill me, then don't tell me. But this <laughs> spreadsheet here, is this something that you have designed? Yes. And what exactly is it analyzing? I mean, what are you typing in? Sure. And what are these formulas within the... Like I said, you don't have to tell me. I, I get it. If you work super hard, I'm not asking you to let any cats out of the bag, but sure. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. So uh, you're typing numbers into a spreadsheet and then that spreadsheet is... Like you said, kind of qualifying whether or not you want to move forward. So, I mean, like you said, it's it's your call. I'll let you sure. go as deep or detailed as you want. But can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a high level here. I won't go over every column, but the inspiration was in value investing. It's very similar. You want to be entering in variables to this Excel sheet. So it really helps make the decision for you. Like what I like in business and through the years is you have to remove emotions from the equation. And that that way you just cut right to the point, like we're, we're generating revenue or we're not generating revenue. Um, so with, with options, I'll kind of rattle them off. What I do 
Right away, I like to look at is the stock on the Dow, the NASDAQ, or the S&P 100. I like stocks that have um, uh, bigger institution money moving in and out. So that's, that's my sweet spot. So right away, that's a qualifier. I like to see the bid ask spread is less than 30 cents. Um, I like to see one like uh, uptrend of the day. If I'm doing a, a call, if it's a put, it's a reverse, so a downtrend. Um, I like to look at the volume and open interest. Theta, I'm kind of going through here as we speak. Um, I do like looking at all the Greeks, but theta, <laughs> theta is the most important, in my opinion. Um, your courses did a great job in describing those, by the way. Um, we went back and forth via chat about the magnet. I love the magnet. Um, I like stocks with a dividend. That, that tells me there's more institutional money moving in and out. So an example there is if, if you like a stock that's moving pre-market, especially if it's on the Dow, from my, and don't, any listeners out there, you don't have to follow this strategy, but that stock tends to have more momentum going up or down through the rest of the day. So, and plus if it has a dividend, that's a good sign. Um, it's just a formula I kind of figured out in the value investing world. So, so that's something I look at. And then, um, then I like the probability of uh, in the money or out, out of the money. Um, so that's, there's, there's a few other columns in there I'm kind of looking at too, but that's really the overall. And then I've got a, a rating system that it, it checks off if it's meeting each of those criteria. So it's like a score. And if the score is over a certain number, that's worth that's worth investing in. Um, and then what I do with paper trading is I do not care about how much money I'm making. I care if I'm profitable or not. And then this is really important. Why? Why am I profitable or why am I not? Because I've got like, I'm looking at this Excel sheet. I'm not kidding you. It goes up to uh, <laughs> column DC. I tr I fully believe you with this description. This is good stuff. I'm uh yeah, keep yeah. Sure. Now, what are you So you mentioned uh, you know you look at the daily chart and you want to see something in an uptrend. So is that like a mental note you're making or is there a column in there's, your spreadsheet where you enter something that says it's in an uptrend? It is and and this is where it gets a little technical and and none of your listeners or anybody has to do this what i do with excel but i have like v lookups to i have a list of like dow stocks nasdaq stocks so if i enter a ticker into the stock it automatically fills other columns based on v lookups to other sheets so it it really is it's slick like i can enter a bunch of variables and it takes me about 30 seconds or less and this thing will just fill with data and then calculate and give me a score at the end of it. Okay. Okay. And this all does make sense. You claim that you weren't that good of a coder, but apparently you learned enough where you could code something like this together. Right. And so you enter in essentially a ticker symbol mm -hmm. and then it self-populates. Is that what occurs? Yeah. It's going to self-populate the, uh, if it's in the Dow, NASDAQ, S&P 100, not 500. And then if it's also, if it has a dividend, and then I have to start entering in uh, other numbers, other like the, like the Greeks I mentioned, volume, open interest, stuff like that. Okay. So there's, it's kind of a mixed self-population mm -hmm. and you have to enter in some numbers. Okay. That, yep. this is making more sense because I'm sitting here thinking, how many columns are there? Because that seems like a lot if he's having a type in every little <laughs> no, thing, no. but okay. So how long, uh, let's just... One one ticker symbol or whatever. How how long would it would the, this whole process and system take to get your score? Sure. Yeah. So usually in the morning, I've got about half hour, forty five minutes, where I'll I'll look at pre market, and then I'll move forward with some investing. And I can usually do analyze a stock within thirty seconds to a minute. I can, you know, entering in the variables, and I may look around on charts a little bit thereafter. But I like to analyze about four or five stocks every morning and that's it that's about as much time as i can fit in and then there are many times like because as i go on and i'm i'm winning and losing um 
I'm kind of disqualifying more stocks. It's actually because it, it's kind of like sighting in a scope. Like if there's any hunters out there, like you just you keep sighting in the formulas. And that way, like there's the other day, I went through five stocks and each one disqualified. It's like, nope, nope, nope. That, you know, each one would lose money for me based on previous um, tests or paper trades I've done in the past. And this, um, and this, the spreadsheet is also taking into account past trades. Is, am I understanding that right? Absolutely. All the historical data, like the goal is with paper trading and I'm actually- This is all on a spreadsheet? Yeah. Holy crap. I apparently, I'm just like scratching the service of uh, the power of a spreadsheet then. Um, so <laughs> this is, this is quite fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, what it does is like the goal was initially is I want to get to 100 paper trades and just analyze the data because at the bottom, the row, it's it's actually calculating like some of these numbers I should be looking for. Like I'll get right to the point here. Like I have a 78% success rate with paper trading. I am fortunately very profitable. But again, with paper trading, I don't care because I'm just buying one contract. I want to find out why, like looking at the data, why am I profitable and why am I not profitable? And this Excel sheet really helps drill that in because really I just, I don't like making emotional decisions in business. I leverage data in my day-to-day -day work. Um, so I apply the same thing to value investing and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try the exact same formula for options trading and so far, fortunately, it's working. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a huge distinction. And I mean, I'm assuming, you know, the tagline of the tr site trade without emotion, right? And yep. however you get to without emotion, well, I'm going to tell you how you focus on the data, you focus on the numbers. Yep. Yeah. Numbers can be different. I, I get my numbers from the, the chart, but at the end of the day, I get it. A chart kind of looks like the matrix and you have these weird things that are called mm -hmm. candlesticks and you have lines, but think about what's making up those candlesticks. Think about, think about what's making up those lines, data, numbers, yep. it's all numbers. So that, and that's why you got to focus on the numbers uh, because you're absolutely right. And that's not only from a business perspective, but really just from a personal finance perspective. It's mm -hmm. if you spend more money than you make the data, there's no <laughs> emotional decision to be had. Right. You are setting yourself up for failure. And that's, I mean, that's, that's a very non-emotional. That's not an opinion. That's not some sort of emotional reaction. No, that's just numbers. That's just data. Mm -hmm. If you spend more than you make, you are going to have problems. Not, and there's no emotion there. That's just a mathematical fact. And that's what, you know, that is the key to, uh, you know, to mastering your emotions. And this is you have to really learn to trust the data and go with the data. Right. You know, so that's, uh, I'm fully on board, on board totally. with your uh, rationale here. And now, I, I'm curious, and again, if, you, if you're going to have to take me and be on the shed and kill me, <laughs> don't tell me, sure. but you, your, your, your quest is, okay, why am I winning? Why am I losing? Correct. So, I mean, have you, for example, so as you stand right now, I realize you're still molding and massaging, but do you have any conclusions right now about, uh, well, let, let me ask it this way. Are you looking at it? Why are you just losing in general? Or are you looking at it, okay, why did I lose on that specific instance? How exactly are you, or are you kind of just trying to take a group of instances and then, mm -hmm. you know, trying to kind of figure out? So I guess, let me just ask it this way. I'm way overcomplicating this. <laughs> sure. What are your conclusions as to why you are losing right now? So with my strategy, I'm looking at not individuals. I am collecting data from multiple really paper trades or I call them, it's really like beta testing is a term you use in software engineering world. Um, so it's really testing this and why did I lose? So I'll tell you one is for my strategy, I, I am better at calls, especially in the month of January, 2019, because that was a pretty good month, a lot of uptrends. Um, so I learned like, hey, your puts, I, I lost, I, I was not successful in some of the puts I did because um, I'd see a stock take a little dip down and then it'd immediately go back up. And I got to look back at, okay, the magnet was the wrong direction on that. So that you didn't look at that. The open interest wasn't high enough. The volume wasn't high enough. So stuff like that. I will say this. I have made calls on stocks that did not fall in the Dow, the NASDAQ, or the S&P 100. 
So right away that tell, and I did that a few times, and finally I had to add those uh, columns to really reveal like why am I losing money on these? And then when I got into it, I'm like, ah, okay, they're not part of the larger pools where institutional funds are throwing money in and throwing money out. So now that's why it's that's like right away in my Excel sheet is like. I got to make sure it, it quali- it's got to land in at least one of those. And there are some stocks that fall in all three. Like I think um, Apple falls in all three. Um, Boeing falls in two. Tesla falls in one. Um, I'm looking at this right now. Netflix falls in two. So those type of stocks, those are, you got some, if they're moving in an uptrend in the morning, okay, there's a good chance they're going to keep moving, especially past noon. So I know I have a good chance of making some money if if the the other um, criteria is met in the Excel sheet. So so yeah, the, I don't like penny stocks. I won't touch. Too risky. Um, I'm looking at some of the other mistakes I made. I've got a notes column here. You probably appreciate that as a process engineer. Um, you can never go wrong with notes. Um, yeah probability I'm, I'm looking at the notes column probability was too low Prob- probability yeah a few of those that are probability was too low you made you made the comment about how in january you learned you're you're really good at calls did i understand that right yes yep now just i'm just can i just speak freely i'm not trying to sure. step on your toes or anything sure. yeah but i would i would just say and maybe you've already factored this in i'm not saying you haven't but I I would contest that the reason you were good at calls in January is because January was essentially a record setting month as far as just an epic, epic bounce. No kidding. So I think that everybody was probably good at calls in January. So that's just something where I don't know if that is, and it could be, like I said, I don't quite understand. So I'm not quite sure if that is a, a function of the system or just a function of the fact that January was literally like a, like a literal record setting month in terms of how much it bounced. So, I mean, have you factored any of that into it? Cause what I, yes. what I don't want to see. Okay. You have. Okay. Yeah. Good. And I, I can speak to that. That's, I knew that that's why I haven't started live trading right away. Cause then I'm like, I have to factor that in. Otherwise, you know, some individuals may be like, okay, I had a great month. I'm going to start live trading right away. So part of me is like, you know what? January was a little too good. (laughs) So let's keep refining these skills before we actually go live. That's my strategy. Awesome. Okay, good. Because um, I I see it all the time. Well, the current one right now is the the Canadian marijuana stocks. Everybody thinks they're God's gift to trading because, oh, well, I started with such and such. And before they even tell me, like, you bought one of those stocks, didn't you? Yeah. I'm like, yes, everybody's making money on those stocks right now. Go talk to the Bitcoin traders from like a year and a half ago. Everybody was God's gift to to trading. We had all these prodigies out there because people were making money hand over fist. And then when things returned to normal, a lot of those people disappeared. So mm-hmm. good. I'm glad you're not confusing just a, a overall context with not that you don't have skill, but you know what I'm getting at. You're not right. letting the two cross over one another because uh, you know I, I see that way too often. And to you as a listener, keep that in mind. Are you and be honest with yourself? Look in the mirror. You know, get, put the kids to bed. Do whatever you got to do. Look in the mirror and be like. Am I, am I truly making money because of skill or am I making money because of some third party, uh, you know, dynamic that's occurring that's maybe making life a little bit easier than what it normally would be. So I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm not shocked, but I just want to throw that out there and make sure that you weren't discounting the fact that I, I think probably everybody was, was, was good at calls and probably everybody was, had a rough time with puts, uh, during the month of January. Mm -hmm. And, um, before I forget what, I don't think you mentioned. Are you using a Thinkorswim as a platform, or what is your actual platform that you're using to gather the data? Yeah, a, l- a little lesson here for all the listeners is when I started value investing, I did homework and joined eTrade. Well, eTrade's platform, it's like their trading platform is called Power Trade. Unfortunately, it has a 15 minute delay. So <laughs> as we speak, I am transferring everything over to TD Ameritrade to get access to the uh, Thinkorswim platform, which I, I've been using it for like two weeks now, but this transfer process, it, it 
does take a while, unfortunately. Um, so I've got these funds kind of in limbo. But uh, yeah, anybody out there, you're listening, you want to be on TD Ameritrade using Thinkorswim. I wish I would have known that. Yeah, that's definitely, uh, it's crazy how powerful that platform is when it comes to options mm -hmm. and all the tools. And I feel like it's, well, the way you've made a spreadsheet work for you, who knows how you're going to get Thinkorswim to work for you. You're probably going to be, I, I don't even want to know. It'll probably blow my mind. But um, so, okay, you bet. And I before I forget another comment, I love how you said, listen, I, I don't care about the money because it's just paper trading right. and it's just, on, and you're not you're not focused on the money, right? I, I don't I don't want to speak for you, but this is a common theme, and I'm pretty sure you're right on board. In other words, Sean, you are focused on building good habits. You're not focused on building some account. Is is that an accurate statement? That's correct. Get better at the discipline. And as a businessman, I'm sure you know that if you build good habits, if you build good systems, mm -hmm. then those systems over time can be scaled upwards. Right. And you know that is the name of the game, figure out a system, build that system, test that system. And after that system's in place, then you can start to scale it upwards and the money will follow. Yep. But if you're, you know, whole baseline of success is, uh, Oh, well look at my, look how much money I've made and on paper, look how much money is. Well, that can be a, a, a little bit deceiving. Now I, I, I asked you why kind of were you losing so but why, why do you think that you're winning as far as your, your analysis of, of, of the data that's spinning you back mm -hmm. um, outside of, yes, the, the, the market, you know, was going up in the, in the month of January and all that. But I mean, what sort of, uh, you know, the, the trades that you are winning, what are you attributing that to mainly? Is it um, some sort of, I guess I'll just let you take it. I mean, what, what is sure. your conclusion? Well, it is really based off the the analysis of leveraging this Excel sheet to help make my decisions for me. Um, that's, that's really it. It's, it's that simple is you pick a stock and, and I, I actually go to a site called barchart.com. There's tons of sites, but it shows like, um, like the trends of stocks pre-market and during the day as well. But, um, that's where I actually start. I want to see what stocks, and it just stacks up hundreds of stocks right there. So I'll look at that and then enter that ticker into the Excel sheet. And then I'll just enter the variables. It'll make a decision for me. And if it passes, great. I'll kind of look at the charts maybe a little more. Um, I won't take more than a minute or two. If it fails, I just move on. Like there's there's no emotions <laughs> it's just really leveraging data to make that decision for me. And it's all the, the columns I mentioned a little earlier. It's, it's not complex. And there's some calculations going on behind the scenes, but it's, it's really not overly complex math. Where did you get these calculations from going on behind the scenes? Uh, some were my own because um, I have a lot of experience doing like net present value type calculus equations and stuff like that. And um, some I had to Google, um, you know, Investopedia is a great site for investors, uh, you know, if you're a value investor, do options trading and whatnot. Um, so that you can find equations there. You got to kind of search the internet, but you get, you know what you're looking for, like the IV magnet, like, let me put my cursor on Excel. That's, that's pretty straightforward math. Listeners, uh, please don't go out there and start Googling Ivy Magnet. It, it's, some, it's something from a course. He's referring to lingo and analogy that I use. So, I mean, you're going to, who knows what sort of rabbit holes you may send yourself down. So that's, <laughs> I know I know exactly what Sean's talking about. Anybody sure. that's taken the advanced options course knows exactly what Sean's talking about. But mm -hmm. please don't, save yourself the time. Don't be going Ivy Magnet. Just don't worry about it. Um, right. That That's what that's referring to. So you are... What, okay, so you have three equations there. What dictated why maybe you chose two of those equations out of the, the third one? Where, where did all these uh, equations come from that either you had to, you know, come up with on your own or that you found someplace else? What, what brought your attention to that specific equation or what brought your attention to the fact that, hey, I need to create that sort of attention or cr create that sort of uh, equation? E equation, sure. So. 
I'll give an example here. This might be a little easier. So the in the E-Trade platform, they do not list the probability of in the money or out of the money. So I had to actually figure out that equation on its own. It's it's I won't go over it here. On this <laughs> Bless part. your heart. Yeah, <laughs> that was not easy. Um, there were actually people that revealed that, but in Thinkorswim, that's actually there for you, which was a wonderful surprise. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm glad that you're going to be going to Thinkorswim because uh, I think your life, you're. I'm not going to say it's going to make your spreadsheet obsolete because it's not, but yeah, just little things like that. You're sure. gonna, it's going to open up a world of ah relief to you. Yep. Otherwise, it's it's not a lot of mathematical equations. Like, for example, the volume I like higher than 500. So, and I use a lot of conditional formatting. So when a number is hit, like it changes a cell green. Um, so if I put in a volume of, I'm looking at one here. Cisco is actually at yesterday. I think it was a 1600 volume. Um, turns green. Okay, so that's a point. Um, Open interest. It's got to be up 300. I think that was an actual um, criteria you mentioned in the course. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's got to be above 300. And in this case, this goes 7,300. So that's a green. And really, like every cell that's green, if I look at the end of the the chart, it just shows how many cells turn green. It's really that simple. In this case. Um, Cisco was a 10 out of 11. I, I have 11 different criteria I'm looking at. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's great. But the probability of being in the money is 39% and my cutoff is actually 40%. So I'm like, kind of on that line with that case. We could really deep dive this over a, a few hours, <laughs> but no, this is good stuff. All right. So my next question. Listeners, I'm sorry, this is what happened when you get an engineer with a guy that has worked with a bunch of engineers. And this is just, but I, I th- I'm pretty sure all listeners are fascinated. Okay, so you just mentioned, you know, oh, it could be at 39%, but if it's at 40%, then you're right on the edge. Mm-hmm. What dictated, why is it 40%? Why is that not, let's just say, 38%? What what goes into, um, you know, all, all, all those little kind of borders that you have drawn mm-hmm. um, as to, is this going to turn green or is it going to remain uh, red or neutral or whatever. I mean, wh- where are those actually lines in the sand coming from? Is that yes. what you're experimenting with now? Or, I mean, wh- but walk me through there because that's one of those things where it's a detail, but to me, it, it's, it, it makes kind of a, it, it's, it's very curious. Yeah. So I was looking at my wins and losses, and then I just reverse back through this Excel sheet and look at the columns and be like, it would take me a little while to analyze. And then I noticed like, Okay, so you're seeing a lot more wins when I'm above 40% in the probability of in the money. Um, so that is why I've made that 40%. That's what's working for me. Um, but like give you an example here, I had a few losses and I was looking at the probability and I'm like, oh, 28%, 30%, 35%. And that's when I kind of, the light bulb went on. I'm like, ooh, that's... Uh, that's got to be why that's not making me any money. So that's why I had to dial that up to 40%. That turns green when it's above 40. So it's, it's one of those things like you look at the trends of why you're losing and winning, and you kind of got to see the correlations. It's it's just takes practice. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. And this is why I'm glad that you're doing this all on paper because you're lots of fine tuning, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless you have a money tree growing out back, uh, you know, a budget is a finite resource and it can almost, it can only take so much fine tuning. Uh, So, so that does make sense. And you are, now let me ask this. So you, you have losers Mm -hmm. and welcome to the club. What, what is dictating when you need to actually realize the loss? Because you know, obviously you can have things that maybe go against you for a little bit, but clearly, you know, not to freak out because I'm assuming some sort of data point on your spreadsheet is saying, Hey, don't sell, just hang in there. But at, at what point or what, what bits of data are telling you when you should actually realize the loss? I don't have any hard decision-making logic on that. I am paying attention to theta. Like if the theta is higher than 10 cents, or I should say negative 10 cents, um, I have to be really careful because <laughs> that can really bite you if you let that go a few days. 
So I will, I will wait a few days. There was one instance when a paper trade, quote unquote, sold it to minimize my downside loss. And then like two days later, the stock just spiked up out of nowhere and I would have been in the money. Um, so I get that that's an anomaly that's going to happen. But I kind of, I don't, I will tell you this, I'm not going to wait until expiration. Like I like picking something that's about 30 days out, roughly. Um, I'm not going to let it go the whole way. And maybe sometimes I will, but I just, I kind of let it go a few days, minimize the loss and get rid of it. Okay. So just from listening in, and I'm not accusing you of not having thought through all of this, mm -hmm. but up until this point, I feel like everything has been so like, listen to the spreadsheet. It spits out colors. It spits out numbers. Boom. That's what I'm making the decision. Now on the loss end, I feel like there's just like all of a sudden your feel comes into place. Am I misunderstanding or because right now there seems to be a disconnect here. Everything up now has been so, so mechanical. Now it's, well, I'm not going to let it get to expiration, but I mean, I might cut it. I don't know. That This seems like you you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, no, this is a good observation. I'm actually making a note on that right now. <laughs> um, okay, good. I'm glad I could help. I, I mean, uh, but I, so, I mean, if you're making a note of it, then you can go um, and stuff and work on it. But yeah, it I mean, just seems to be, and I, there's no doubt in my mind, you, you can put something in there, but it just seems to be so, so mechanical, which is awesome. Cause that's, uh, Chez is going to be so bummed that he's not here, but, uh, I mean, that's, that's the goal. Uh, but it just seems, um, well at, at what point, you know, at what point does a cell turn right and say, sell, sell, because I mean, that's just kind of, it sounds like that's what you're going after. So thank you for not taking that as like, uh, no, no uh, insults or anything like no, that, I'm, but that, I'm, that's, uh, I admit I'm, I'm very new to this. So I'm, I'm very much like a sponge, just learning as much as I can. But you know, this, that critical feedback is awesome because I'm already thinking about, okay, I got to spend a little more time reentering data, which I think is fine to monitor it, um, thereafter and maybe trigger alert me in some way, way like, Hey, you're going to want to sell this, but it, that'll take a little thought, but that's a, a great thought there. Clay. Okay, good. Well, I, I'm glad that's, uh, that, that can kind of maybe push you in another direction. Sure. Um, and just something have you, because I was there and I, I would sit there and I'm not saying you're doing this. I, I think that, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely, you're, you're after the right thing. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, friend to friend, trader to trader, just be very careful from my experience of trying to find the holy grail of holy grails. Um, because yeah, well, if I had bumped that up to 40%, then it would have been green. Mm -hmm. But the problem is maybe something else, you're going to have something else that uh, was at 38%, let's just say, and that would have actually kept you in the trade. So now all of a sudden it's like, well, is it 38% or is it 40%? I mean, which one are, is it going to be? Are you? Is there a, a system in place that, that's allowing you to account for that sort of stuff? You know what? You're right. Because there have been times when I've disqualified a, a trade and I've still kept it on the Excel sheet and then monitored it thereafter. And, and there's, I mean, the opportunity I missed in some cases, I, I'll give you an example. Like there was a, there's a case where Netflix did not pass for me in a specific day. I'm like, Nope, not doing it. I think this is going to dive. And, um, that stock just took off like the next two days. And I, <laughs> I could have made a good, a good amount of paper money, quote unquote, <laughs> but I know that's going to happen. That's in, I got to figure out some of those formulas too. I, th I think it'll come in time, but, um, you, you know, as, as we know, you're going to win some and lose some like that. And, and there's things that I learned in value investing. You have no control over like, a CEO could say the wrong thing or, or there's some news or regulation change or something. And those things are always going to happen. You just got to just let it roll off your back. Well, let me, let me encourage you in that way because you understand, but you made a comment, such and such thing could happen. And, and then, then I'm just going to have to, I, I got to just work on the equations. I would say, you know what? Maybe I don't think you would have to work on the equations because to your point, sometimes things just happen mm -hmm. and there is, you got to draw a line at some point and say, these are my equations. These are what I feel comfortable with. And if something goes wrong, well, that's just like you said, that's just how the market goes is because you got, 
like you said, this is all coming from experience. If you allow it, then it's, well, something went wrong. Well, now what do I got to tweak? And then always you're tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's just a matter of, you know what? The only thing went wrong is that the market did what the market does. It's random. And at the end of the day, you got to just make sure that you control the randomness, which, uh, you know, is why, you know, loss control and risk mitigation and risk management, all that stuff is so important because, um, yeah, at, at a point it's just, there's not, there's literally nothing you could do. I, the, your spreadsheet, right. I, I mean, you know what I mean? It's just, you just got to like, I love that analogy though. Like you can't, you cannot predict if a CEO is going to open up his mouth and just totally crap all over the place. It's like, well, that definitely was out of my control. Yep. You know what? There's things in the options world and just in the market that are going to be out of your spreadsheets control no matter what. So it's not necessarily, uh, I'm not saying it's not maybe an equation like, huh? I mean, if it keeps happening over and over and over again, but just because a couple of losses happen, I, I just say, be careful of all of a sudden thinking, jumping to the conclusion that, well, I got to make more, you know, uh, I got to more, make more changes to the spreadsheet. Does that make sense? Totally. And that's the same thing in my main line of work. You can over engineer and over analyze things that are really out of your control. And, and no matter what you do, you're never going to have a hundred percent success rate. I mean, you look at pro athletes, you're not going to hit a home run every time. You're not going to get a touchdown every throw, <laughs> you know, that's, that's life. But you look at the trends. Okay. Are your statistics in your favor? Do you have more wins than losses? That's it's really the best you can do. Absolutely. Beautifully said. So I would say, remember what you just said and apply that to the spreadsheet because you don't want to, you you don't want to over engineer it because you're absolutely right. But uh, I will say this: um, this you are you're definitely, if anything, maybe you are at risk of thinking too much, mm-hmm. which is a breath of fresh air because, again, in the the customer service chat box world, sometimes are you thinking at all, sir? Are you thinking at all, ma'am? What what are you thinking? But you are definitely thinking. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. And um, you got to come back at some point because I, I want to hear how this all sure. continues to play out. Um, but last question before we start to wrap things up here, when you do go live, what sort of amounts of money are you going to be looking, uh, looking to use? I mean, do you have some sort of, as part of the spreadsheet, um, you know, are, are you, do you have criteria in terms of, well, I want to be able to do that contract because that's too expensive because I'm only going to be using, you know, X amount, but what, what exactly is kind of the, the, the money management system going to be in terms of when you go live? Sure. So I'll kind of give you an idea here um, of, I won't give you the number of funds I'm going to move into this account from E-Trade, um, but then I'll give you uh, my goals, my my income goals per month. So E-Trade, I've, I've got a, a good sizable chunk of change that's going to move over to TD, and that will be used primarily for value investing, but I'll probably start with I don't know, maybe 2,500 to 5,000 for options trading. I'm not going to go all in right away, but I want to start there. And like with value investing, you're going to have down days, you're going to have up days. So I'm, I'm not too concerned with little losses, which I know they will happen. I'm really looking at the trends here. Like I said earlier, I've got about 80% success rate, 78% specifically um, with options trading, paper trading at least. So the goal is, and just very modest goal, in my opinion, um, I want to start making $1,000 a month swing trading. Once that benchmark is hit, let's aim for $5,000. And then after that benchmark is hit, um, we'll see where it goes from there. I'll say that. But uh, I just, you know, let's just aim for 1000 bucks a month is really where I want to start. And um, really, to be honest with you, it's really just like we touched on earlier, it's the discipline is focus on the process and the discipline and the money will come thereafter. What sort of amount do you think you would be comfortable with losing? Have you thought about that? Because I realize the spreadsheet is very mechanical, Mm -hmm. but if you're sitting there and holy smokes, I could be losing, fill in the blank. I don't care how good a spreadsheet is. You're going to freak yourself out and you're not going to be able to follow anything that the spreadsheet's telling you. So have you determined at all what sort of actual money you would actually be okay and peace of mind with potentially losing? That's a good question. I think because in in my value investing account, you know, there's some, we had a rough 
fourth quarter, 2018. Um, and I was comfortable because I know what I'm in and know what's going back up. So uh, I think if I lost $5,000 or less, I would be comfortable with that because I know I can make that up. Okay. So you have a good general idea, which is important. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I want to make sure you, you obviously don't overlook because yeah, sure. I mean, you could have an absolutely beautiful, beautiful system, but if you're not okay with the, the, the real life numbers staring back at you, as far as a loss, then mm -hmm. you're just gonna, you will totally freak out. And that would be a little bit of, that, that would be counterproductive. Right. So yeah, we're definitely gonna have to have you back. Sure. And, uh, I, I, I want to hear more about how this all plays out for you. Um, uh, but, um, I'm trying to think if there's any other questions, but yeah, you've explained, I'm, what should the title of this thing be? The spreadsheet <laughs> master? I don't know. I'm just spitballing some, I don't know, but yeah, this was definitely, um, interesting. And for you listeners out there, well, geez, there is a lot of stuff that he's doing. Well, yeah, you know, trading is a bit more than let me pay such and such for text alerts that they're going to send me. There, there, there is more that goes into trading than that, despite what some people may make you, you know, try to believe. Um, now, am I saying that you have to go teach yourself coding and become a spreadsheet wizard like Sean? Right. I'm not necessarily saying that. The point here is that th there's more than, you know, there's more that goes into trading that what some people kind of try to lead you to believe. So just something to keep in mind there. And I think that's a, a very worthwhile lesson um, from all this. But final question, and I don't know if, I have no idea how you're going to answer this, but Chess has a time machine. And if he were to give mm -hmm. you that time machine and you could go back to some point in the past and give yourself one bit of advice, what would that bit of advice be? I knew this question was coming, obviously, because I've been listening to your podcast for a while, but I, I would go back to high school and tell myself to pursue a career in finance. I, I didn't know I loved, you know, up until 2015, 16, I knew I loved investing. But when I really started getting involved with the stock market, I'm like, this is awesome. I, I love this. Um, I wish I would have got into finance a lot earlier. I'm kind of with you there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I do like, I mean, but what you do, the market, I mean, it is, it's, it's a big old puzzle, mm -hmm. right? And, and you got to kind of try to figure out how these pieces come together and what's the most efficient manner and to just continue to kind of piggyback, piggyback off what you're saying. Look, I don't want any emotions, you know, punch emotions in the face. How do you punch them? You know, the best boxing glove for some emotions is some data and you're all about the data, which is yep. exactly, uh, exactly what you should be after. So yeah, good stuff. And we're going to have to have you back for sure. But you also know now what's coming. Yep. And uh, I'd like to try to guess what you're, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a movie <laughs> that's got a bunch of spreadsheets in it, but I have no idea of any movie that's got a bunch of spreadsheets in it. But what is your favorite movie? Inception. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Yep. That spinning top at the end, just mm -hmm. total, just, Oh man, right? that that's a great that's a great movie for sure. I gotta watch that now that you bring it up. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's it's a fr for you listeners. It's a Friday as we record this. Maybe my wife and I will have an Inception movie night tonight. But uh, what about your favorite? Now I won't do the stereotypical, and I realize I'm doing it indirectly here. I won't do the stereotypical. Your favorite food must be cheese because you're in Wisconsin. But what is actually your favorite food and dessert? Um, well, I like cooking and I like seafood and I really like a good salmon, like smoked cedar plank salmon. Oof. It's fantastic. And healthy for yeah, you. So sure. It's, it's hard to go wrong with the, well, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, the more I learn about you, you're the, you're the outdoorsman. Do you catch these salmon yourself? Well, I have a little bit. I don't fish. Um, a whole lot. Like if you really want to get some nice salmon, you got to be fishing in Lake Michigan. And I'm on a um, more of an in-water lake uh, west of Milwaukee. And you, you catch a lot of panfish, um, bass. I usually just catch and release. We have muskie out here. I don't know. Do you have muskie over there in Michigan? Honestly, I, I like to chop wood and I'm I like to go hiking, but hunting, fishing, okay. I don't do any of that stuff. So I, I really don't know. I'd have to ask my, <laughs> my father-in-law or brother-in-law. Sure. So I don't know, Sean. I have no idea. It sounds familiar though. I think we do, but that could be a massive lie. Sure. But all right. Awesome. And then, dessert. uh, what? Yeah. Dessert. That's easy. Ice cream. 
I mean, you can't go wrong. What kind of ice cream? I tell you what, if you put like a Dairy Queen uh, cookie dough, like a full cake in front of me, I would eat that thing. I would not feel good afterwards, but I'd eat the whole thing. <laughs> It'd be so worth it, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> absolutely. Every bite. It's, yeah, it absolutely is worth it. I, I know. I uh, that That's some good stuff there. No doubt about it. And hobby wise, what do you? I guess you kind of revealed this. You're an sure. outdoorsman, but I mean, what do, what do you, I mean, heck, what do you like to do outdoor doors or if there's something else that you can address this question with, but what do you like to do hobbies? Yeah, I, I've got a, a lot of hobbies. So summertime is, that's definitely my season. So I, I'm on a lake here. So do a lot of boating, a little fishing, but I also do a lot of like trail riding and mountain biking. We don't have quote unquote mountains <laughs> here in Wisconsin, but there's definitely, you can find some tough trails. So I like chewing up some dirt. Um, working out. Um, yeah, a lot of outdoors, a lot of hiking. I've got a chocolate lab. Um, he loves walking. We're, we're walking every morning, every night. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Awesome. What's the chocolate lab's name? His name is Sam. Okay. I thought you were going to say Theta. <laughs> it's not that nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. You're you're getting pretty nerdy. We're, I think we both nerded out here quite a sure. bit, but uh, that's okay. No, that this has been good stuff. And then final question here: three words, and these three words would need to be what you would uh, associate with what you think you know it takes to be a, a successful trader. So, what would those mm -hmm. three words be? Focus, patience, and humility. I like that. Definitely focus, patience required, and ex humility big time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's, if you are not humble, the market will gladly serve you a piece of humble yep. pie. And I, I, I may or may not have had several pieces of those over the years. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Right. But Sean, uh, thank you again for hanging out. Uh, for listeners' context, well, I don't know. I don't think I thanked you, but thank you first off for even volunteering. I really appreciate sure. that. You make uh, our, our life much easier. And then also from a listener's point of view, we're recording this on a Friday afternoon. So when most people are like just sitting there drooling over themselves, waiting for the weekend to start, Sean took some time out of his day to, to you know, come here and do the podcast. So I thank you on both of those sure. accounts. And as we've established, you're, you're, you're going to be, I'm not even going to ask you if you're going to come back. I'll just tell you, you're going to come back, Great. Sean. You're going to keep us posted on things because I want to, I want to continue to hear how this journey unfolds. Sure. But Sean, thank you again very much. Yeah. Thank you, Clay. This has been fun. Awesome. Awesome. Before you go as listeners, a final few things. First off, if you're listening on YouTube, check out the rest of the channel. Lots of other videos there. And uh, besides these, these uh, podcasts, so hopefully you decide to ultimately subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, subscribe. And also on iTunes, if you could leave us a rating, leave us a positive comment, that goes a long way, really helps us out and just you know gets the name out there that much more. And uh, we really would appreciate that. And then finally, if you're listening at claytrader.com on the show notes page, click that share button. And then down below, there is a comment area uh, down below the thumbnail image that is. And if you uh, reply or if you leave a comment, suggestion, question, I guess if you want to troll me, that's fine too. I will interact with you. I try to get as interactive as people as possible, uh, but I'd love to hear from you and uh, hope to hear from you. So thank you again, Sean. Chez, get well. And listeners, we'll see you back next week. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.